thanks so much for being with us this morning. Thanks for being here in person. It's always great to see happy, vibrant faces, and thanks for joining us online. Um, some of you I know that are watching online, you probably just rolled out of bed, so it's probably good we're not seeing your semi-vibrant faces this morning, but you can see us, so that's all that matters. Hey, will you stand up with me? We're going to look at a couple passages of Scripture this morning. The first is from Matthew 3, verses 16 and 17, and then Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20. I'm going to start with Matthew 3. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love, with whom I am well pleased. And then Matthew 28, verse 19. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always until the end of the age. Father, we thank you for this message today of you as Trinity, of one God in three persons in these verses, in these verses from the baptism of Jesus in Matthew 3 and the Great Commission in Matthew 28. Father, we thank you that you have revealed yourself to us. You who are beyond our comprehension have shown us yourself in the Son. And so, Father, I pray that, that your word will find fertile ground in our hearts, in our minds, that you'd open our eyes and our ears to the truth of who you are this morning. And let that be done in such a way that it alters our lives and our community. We ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> hey, I want to talk about something that's old school just for a moment. And, and don't, like, look at me as the grumpy old guy who's talking about all the cool stuff that used to be. But... But I want to talk about the dinner table for just a moment. You know, as, as a family, when our kids were growing up, and even today with our boys, we always had dinner together. We, we'd sit around the table together, and, and I never really gave much thought as to why we did that. And it was one of those things that we always did growing up, and that was probably part of it. But I also think, looking back on eating together as a family, what I found is that there was a deeper reason, a, a twofold reason into why we always had dinner together as a family. And that twofold reason is belonging and access. We, we, when we ate together, we created a space for the entire family to belong and to share our lives and to share our joys and our struggles. And a meal sitting around a table gives everyone access to that place of belonging. So as soon as you sit at that table, you now have access to that place of belonging. By sitting down together, we're saying to everyone that's seated at the table, you belong and this table provides you access to that space. That space where you will find out you belong. And here's the thing. We all need a space of belonging and we need to have access to that space, particularly if we're going to live into a community of love and care and security. See, belonging is essential to a community of of love for a community that's going to truly teach us what love is and shape our lives. But I have to have access as well. To have that community out there where I belong and to have no access to it would just lead to frustration, right? And so here's what we're looking at today. This morning, we're going to look at our second and third and fourth statements of faith all together in one message. And, and I want to invite you to go to our website and look at those statements of faith. But this morning we're talking about the second, third, and fourth statement that all speak to the nature of God. And in short, these three statements, when you put them together, these statements of faith, they convey our stance on a theological doctrine called the Trinity. So we've all heard that word, I'm sure. And, and the thing we need to understand about the Trinity which is kind of silly to say this at the beginning of a message where I'm going to explain the Trinity, but know this, the Trinity is impossible for us to grasp. We'll never fully grasp it. We can't. And so now you're thinking to yourself, well, then why are you still talking? Well, because I wrote it and I'm going to say it. So, but here's what I want to do. I want to start with a couple truths. The first is from Isaiah 55, 8. These are truths that we need to keep in mind as we explore the Trinity. Isaiah 55, 8 says this, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, says the Lord. So part of the reason we can't grasp the Trinity is because God's thoughts are not our thoughts and His ways are not our ways. 
It's impossible for us to think the way God thinks, although he invites us into thinking more the way he thinks, but we'll never, as finite beings, ever think fully the way an infinite God thinks. And then here's this truth in 1 Corinthians 3.12. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. So the other thing we have to keep in mind when we look at the doctrine, the theology of the Trinity, is that everything I see now is only in part. Eventually, when I'm face to face with God, I will see fully. But here's the problem. We're trying to grasp the, ter- the Trinity on this side of eternity, which means we will only see it in part. And so as we begin to explore the doctrine of the Trinity today, I'm going to ask you to keep these two truths in mind. Number one, God doesn't think the way we think. And number two, we can never see fully God on this side of his presence. And so here's where we land. The Trinity is a great mystery of God's essence and eternal existence in three persons, yet one God. And that means that maybe it's best to try to live in the reality of God as Trinity instead of trying to fully explain it and understand it. And so I think we can become comfortable with this great mystery if we focus more on relationship with God, who is Father, Son, and Spirit, one God in three persons, than on trying to explain doctrine to others. Now, the best explanation of the doctrine of the Trinity is when you see it lived out in my life. If I want someone who doesn't understand the Trinity to understand the Trinity, the best thing I can do is live out my relationship with God in such a way that you see it. And so if we seek the concept of Trinity as a a way of relating, then we'll understand the Trinity as a way of life. And so this is what I think Paul summed up in Acts 17, 28. Listen to this. For in him we live and move and have our being. And so that's my goal this morning. So knowing that God is one in three persons should result in a seismic shift in how I live and move even down to the very core of my being. And so that's what we want to pursue today. My goal this morning is to help you to see that God as Trinity means that we have a place of belonging in God And we have access to that place through Jesus, who is God the Son. And so I think the words of the early church father, John of Damascus, are kind of helping set the tone of how I'd like to approach the doctrine of the Trinity. Listen to this quote from him. The Trinity is understood and worshipped by faith. By faith. Not by inquiry or investigation or demonstration. The harder you look, the less you will find. The more you seek, the more it will be hidden. God ought, therefore, to be worshipped by believers with an incurious mind. Believe that God exists in three hypostases, that's persons. But how this can be is beyond our understanding because God is incomprehensible. And so with that as the backdrop, with that as the background that we're going to walk into I want us to press towards the Trinity. I believe that what these words from John of Damascus convey is exactly what Paul's talking about in Romans eleven thirty three. 33. Listen to this. Of oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. And so the invitation I have for you today is to embrace God as mystery. And by doing that, it puts us in a position to seek him by faith. And we are saved by faith, not understanding. And so my hope is that you will be able to say, I will allow God to be mystery to me this morning because I know he is incomprehensible. And in doing that, I'll position myself to seek him by faith. And so here's what we see in the two texts that I read you this morning in Matthew 3, 16 and 17, and Matthew 28, 19 and 20. What we see is God present in three persons at the same time and in the same place. God the Son being baptized, God the Father speaking, God the Spirit descending. And when Jesus sent the believers out with the Great Commission, 
He told them to go out in the name of God the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. One God, three persons, same time, same place. Now here's the thing. There's many, many other proof texts for God as Trinity throughout Scripture, but I think these two are sufficient for us as believers. I think reading these two texts gives us a place to stand where we can say, yes, I can accept that although it's a great mystery to me, God exists. One God in three persons. Now, I have an illustration I want to show you right now that might be somewhat helpful in this. And this has been around a long time. But simply put, we get this illustration that says the Father is not the Son, and the Father is not the Holy Spirit. And the Son is not the Father, and the Son is not the Holy Spirit. But the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Spirit is God. And so that's just a picture to hold on to. I don't know that this picture is going to say, oh, well, now I finally grasp it. I understand it all. But it's a picture to hold on to as we talk through this a little bit. And so here's what I want to tell you. If you are struggling with believing the truth of the Trinity, I want to invite you to reach out to me, to Pastor James. Probably Pastor James would be a better option. That guy knows everything about everything. So if you want to have a conversation about Trinity, and, and you want to start down here, call me. If you want the answers, call him. But remember, for us this morning, this is simply about embracing the mystery of God and living into the truth of the Trinity. This isn't simply about intellectual understanding of the Trinity. I want us to see the belonging and access in the Trinity this morning. The belonging that we're all invited into, and the access that we have to that. So listen to this from 1 John 4, 16. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love. And whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. So what we get from that verse is that God is love. We all accept that, right? We sing about it. We talk about it. Heck, we count on it. We count on the fact that God is love. Now here's the thing. Love needs three things. Love, to exist, needs a lover, the one who loves. It needs a beloved, the one who is loved. And it needs the love that flows between those two. So God is love. Love demands that three things exist. The lover, the beloved, and the love itself. Now, Augustine of Hippo, one of the early church fathers, explained it this way. He said this, If God is love, then he must be triune in nature. Existing complete in himself as the lover, the beloved, and the love that flows among them. So, to hash out this idea just a little bit further, what we get, because God is love, is the Father, eternal and unchanging, is love. God the Father is love. And as such, because he's eternal and unchanging, he has to have an eternal beloved. Otherwise, he's not love. That eternal beloved is Jesus, the eternal Son of God. And out and in that, there also must be the love between them that holds that together. And that outflowing of love between them is the Holy Spirit that holds the perfect bond of love together. So what we have is God, eternal in nature and in three persons, yet one God in essence with an eternal plan to create in love because he is love. And through that, an eternal plan of redemption to invite the created beings, us, all of humanity, into that love relationship. So we go back to John, uh, 1 John 4.16. Here's what we get. Whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. So God is love, which means he is self-contained relationship within himself. In three persons, Father, Son, and Spirit, so that we can abide in him and he can abide in us. It's an abiding in type of love, which is God's very nature, love. 
Now, are you exhausted yet? Are you ready to give up? Don't quit just yet. Don't quit yet. We're going to keep going just a little bit further. So in order for us to abide in God and for him to abide in, abide in us in love, we need redemption. And the Trinity brings that about as well. So we have God existing in three persons because he is love. And he wants to invite us, his creatures, into that relationship of love. Therefore, the creation must be redeemed to be in the love of God, who is Trinity. So here's what we get. The Trinity brings about that redemption. So we have God the Father in 1 Corinthians 8, 6, plans redemption. God the Son in Ephesians 1, 7, accomplishes that redemption. And God the Spirit in 2 Thessalonians 2, 13, applies that redemption. He seals it for all who believe. So all of this should help us see why it is necessary for God as love to exist as three persons. One in essence, yet three in person. And so the doctrine of the Trinity is absolutely foundational to our faith. Without it, God is not love, and he cannot invite us into a place of belonging and access. And so here's something that's important. A right concept of God is absolutely essential and basic to how we will practically live out our faith. Listen to this quote from A.W. Tozer. This is powerful. What comes to our mind when we think about God is the most important thing about us. Think about that. The most important thing about you is what comes to your mind when you think about God. And the Trinity actually gives us a right way of thinking about God. So God is love. That requires a lover. It requires a beloved. And it requires the love that flows among them. So now listen to this in 1 John 3, verse 1. See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God. So what this verse tells us is that God as love is the source of love. Any love that any of us have experienced for anything, if it's true love, has come from God who is love. And why did he do that? To what end does he pour his love out on us? That we should be called children of God. That's belonging and access. Children belong. They have a place to belong. And because they're children, they have access to that place. That is the point of God existing in three persons in Trinity. Belonging and access. Now think about this. If I am alone, and I have always been alone, and I invite you to join me in my aloneness, I'm actually inviting you into my isolation and solitude. I'm not inviting you into any type of community. And so now we get John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. So for God so what? For God so loved. He loved. He loved because he is love. To be love means that by nature, if you are love, you must exist in three persons. The lover, the beloved, and the love itself. Now here's a side note, because we think, well, I love people, and I don't exist in three persons. Let me just say this. You are capable of loving. We all are. But we are not, in essence, in nature, love itself. When we love, we don't love from a source of being love ourselves. We love from a source of God being love in us. And so only God is love in essence and nature, even though we have the capacity to love. Now God the lover in John 3.16 gives his beloved so that those who believe in Jesus can have eternal life in the community of love, which is God himself, the Trinity. Now, access to that eternal life 
comes through belief, according to John 3.16. We must believe. Well, where does belief come from? Listen to this in 1 Corinthians 12.3. No one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. So now all of a sudden in John 3.16, what we get is the Trinity at work in our lives for our salvation. God the Father, the lover, gives the beloved, the Son, so that whoever believes in Him through the power of the Holy Spirit will have eternal life. John 3.16 is actually an invitation into the very community of the Trinity itself. It's an invitation to live in God who is one in three persons. Remember what John 17.3 says? Eternal life is knowing God, right? And knowing God means to be in intimate and loving relationship with Him. But here's the question. How can we, as less than perfect humans, have belonging in and access to the perfect community of love that is God in three persons? Well, listen to this in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13. For in one spirit, right, the third person of the Trinity, we were all baptized into one body. And what is that one body we were baptized into? Well, it's the church, which is the body of Christ, according to 1 Corinthians 12, 27. And Christ is God. He is the second person of the Trinity. So to be in Christ now is to be in God. Belonging and access. And if that wasn't enough to convince you that God offers us belonging in and access to himself through Christ, then listen to this in Ezekiel 36, verse 27. And I will put my spirit, with a capital S, the third person of the Trinity, within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. This is a prophetic verse of what would happen after the Messiah came, that we would be indwelt with the Holy Spirit. Jesus reiterated that prophetic promise to his followers in John 15, 26. And then we get to Acts 2 on the day of Pentecost, and the day comes where God pours out his Spirit, and its Spirit inhabits their hearts. And so we are the body of Christ, right? Baptized into that one body. We are the body of Christ, who is the second person of the Trinity. And we are the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit, who is the third person of the Trinity. And that Holy Spirit, according to Ezekiel 36, 27, causes us to walk in God's statutes and obey His rules. Now I'm going to give you one more piece of the puzzle. 1 John 4, 12. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another... God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. So I've already shown you that we have belonging in and access to the Trinity because we are the body of Christ and because we are the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit. Finally now, when we love, which is the very nature and essence of God, we abide in him and he abides in us. Belonging in and access to the community of the Trinity, of God himself. (sighs) I feel like I just gave birth to a theologian. I know that was some deep water to tread through. But don't give up because we're almost to the shore. We're we're, we're like, we're, we're at our waist now. We're not over our heads anymore. So here's what we get. If God's greatest and highest desire is for us to be in Him, to live the out that in Himness, then do you see why it's necessary for God to exist as one God in three persons? Do you see that now? I can't explain how He did it. I can't explain what it functions like and what it looks like, but I can see the absolute necessity of God being one God in three persons because he is love and because he wants us to abide in that love and he wants that love to abide in us. So now we're back to the mystery. The mystery is I have no idea 
what it looks like for one God to exist in three persons. But I know what it feels like. I know what it's like to be in that God. And I know what it's like for that God to be in me. And so God himself is a community of love unto himself. And that community of self-existent and self-fulfilled love is the Trinity. One God, three persons. Now here's why that should matter to everyone who has ever lived. Because God, as a community of perfect love, is inviting us into a community of deep belonging, of love, of security, of affection, of concern, of compassion, of kindness, of beauty, of devotion, and of joy, which is the Trinitarian community itself, which is God. Everyone longs for that kind of community. We need that kind of community. And the reason we need that kind of community is because that is exactly what we were created for. And guess what he's doing? He's making that kind of community accessible through Jesus. So the doctrine of the Trinity gives us a deep sense of confidence that we belong in and have access to the very community of God as one God in three persons through Jesus. And we can enter that community with confidence. Listen to Hebrews 4.16. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Because God is Trinity and He is accessible through Jesus, He will never turn us away when we seek to enter into that community as long as we seek to enter that community through the person of Christ, God the Son. He's going to refine us and He's going to transform us by the Holy Spirit, but we can't ever make the mistake of thinking that God's transforming of us is somehow a rejection of us. That his transformation is somehow him denying us belonging in the community of himself or that it's somehow him shutting down the access to the community of himself. He's never denying us a sense of belonging in that community of himself. He's never shutting down access to that. In fact, we need to understand that we belong more in that community of God than we do anywhere else. Listen to this in Psalm 100, verse 3. Know that the Lord, He is God. It is He who made us, and we are His. We are His people and the sheep of His pasture. The most important three words in that verse to me is we are His. We are His. The belonging in and the access to the community of the Trinity is the only natural response of a creator to his creation. Why would God create anything that he does not want in himself? And how could he have us in himself if he was not perfect community in and unto himself? So I want to, I want to leave you with one specific dinner table experience. Years and years ago, our oldest daughter she had a friend who was always at our house. She was like one of our kids. And this sweet young girl had countless dinners with us. But one particular night, she was eating at our house with us. And it was right about the time her family was going through some really difficult struggles. And those struggles actually ended up in a divorce. And during that meal at this time, now mind you, she had eaten with us many, many times. But during that particular meal, she looked around and looked up at us and said, do you guys always eat like this? And we're like, well, yeah. That's how we eat. And even though she had seen this many, many times, and she'd even been a part of it many, many times, the difference this time 
was that her own place of belonging was falling apart. She no longer had access to a safe community of love within her own household. So she noticed the one we had created because she needed it desperately in this moment. And she needed it to be real in this moment. And here's what I know. There's some of us in here today who desperately need a community of belonging and need to know it's accessible. It might be because of some situation in your life where your place of belonging is falling apart. Or maybe you found out what you thought was a place of belonging never really was, and it's collapsed. And that's convinced you maybe that you don't have a place of belonging anywhere or that you can't access your place of belonging anymore. In short, you're at a place where you realize or sense that a community that kept you safe and that you found love in is actually falling apart before your eyes. Might be family, might be friendships, might be the place you work or where you go to school. Could be anything. But can I just tell you this about the Trinity? If you're in that spot, the Trinity is the ultimate place of belonging. It is our ultimate destination, the place where we will feel a sense of belonging more than anywhere else. And here's the most important part. You have full access to that place through Jesus Christ. You have full access to the place of belonging in the perfect community of love, which is God himself through Jesus Christ. And the doctrine of the Trinity is a foundation of faith for that reason. The very reason that because God is a Trinitarian, one God in three persons, we all have access to that community of love. And we belong there. If we will just recognize, first, we need a place to belong, and there's no place of belonging on this planet that is sufficient. And we have access to that place of belonging through Christ. That's why this doctrine is foundational to the faith. It's not simply foundational to the faith so that we can stand up and go, we're not like those pagans who have different gods for everything. We have one God in three persons. That's not why it's foundational. It's foundational because it conveys to us the very meaning and purpose of life and it gives us access to God who is our life. And so here's what I want to do. As we get ready to sing this song, this last song to close our service out this morning, I want to invite you into letting the Holy Spirit impress upon you a deep sense of belonging in the community of the Trinity. I don't care if you feel like you're in the center of it or if you feel like it's at a place that you can never get to and you don't belong there. Will you just, as we sing, will you just say, Spirit, God, show me my place of belonging in you in ways I've never seen it before. And as you do that, Think about the fact that you have full access. Every space in God is open to you because of the person of Jesus Christ. You are invited into him to live and move and have your being. See, here's what I think the Trinity does. What I think the Trinity does, it's, it does this. It says you need to know and understand God so that you can live in him. If we stop at knowing and understanding, nothing changes. We become what people in recovery used to call a dry drunk. You're not drinking anymore, but you're not happy. Doctrine only will leave us in a place of I know, and I'm going to stand on this, but it will never invite me into the joy of being in loving relationship which is God himself. The doctrine of the Trinity should make it clear to us that there is a place of belonging 
And it should make it clear to us that we have access to that place of belonging. But if you will not get up and move into that place, it does you no good. Father, we thank you so much that you are a community of love in and of yourself, that you invite us into that community, that you have told us and revealed to us that we belong in that community that is you, a perfect community of love, one God in three persons, and that you are the lover of all of us, And through the Son, Jesus, we become your beloved. And by the power of you, the Spirit dwelling in us, you draw us deeper into that place of belonging. And so God, if there's anyone here today who thinks they don't belong, would you, Spirit God, impress upon their heart and their mind that this has nothing to do with them. Their belonging is not a product of who they are. It's a product of who you are, one God in three persons. And as we sing, will you impress upon them the access that they have into that beautiful community that is so perfect that is you through Jesus. We ask that in his name.